Okay, it is 601, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so can y'all hear me? Are we good to go? Okay, see one thumbs up. Can people in chat verify? Okay, I see one person says yes, so that's enough for me. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so today we're gonna cover moderation and mediation. Uh, today's class, we're still learning about inferential statistics, but this will be a little bit different. Um, all the inferential statistics we've learned so far are really focused on uh, what we would call direct effects. It's looking at things like the relationship between variables, the difference between groups. Uh, the thing we're going to cover today is actually going to, uh, I guess, test an entire model. That so we're going to go more than we're going to do more than just test direct effects. Instead, we're going to test an entire model. And analyses for moderation and mediation uh, can test relatively simple models. It's a little bit more complex than just direct effects, uh, but it's not anything overly complicated. And that's why I teach it at the end of this semester, because it gets you uh, a first exposure to model testing. So therefore, in your future stats classes, or if you were to enroll in a business PhD program, uh, you would cover a lot more model testing, as opposed to just looking at individual direct effects like we would in correlation or regression, or even t-test or ANOVA. So therefore, today we're covering moderation first and then mediation. Uh, one thing to note is don't forget the exam is on Monday and papers are due on Wednesday. So I hope you uh, have this weekend to study and you get prepared for that exam and you finish up those papers. Uh, so before we start, does anyone have any comments or questions about anything, uh, whether test related, paper related or class related? I have a question about yes. decimal points. Um, mm -hmm. in your, on your website, your examples always have more than three, but my Jamovi defaults to three. Does it matter as far as you're concerned when we put figures down? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Um, so I will say it, as long as you include at least one uh, digit after the decimal point, so as long as you include at least the tenths, then that will be enough. Um, I tend to default to two numbers after the decimal place, uh, but I will have all the exam and I had to fix the homework uh, to accept answers that include only one number after the decimal place. Uh, so as long as you have one, you'll be fine. Um, okay, thanks. Yep, and then that's a good point, and that brings up two other things, is first off, if you already did the homework, there's a good chance that you missed the first question, and this goes to the entire class. Uh, that's probably because I initially set up the homework, and I forgot to tell Canvas to uh, account for decimal rounding, so I had to go back, and if you already turned it in, there's a good chance that you now have another point added to your score, uh, because I had to fix that in Canvas. Uh, the second note is I have a lot of students who email me about this decimal question, uh, so first off, yeah, if, as long as you put at least one number, oh, sorry about that, let me mute my phone. As long as you put one number after the decimal, you'll be fine. Uh, so I will accept that on the test, I'll accept that on homework, uh, at least one number after the decimal. Uh, if you care about decimal places though, if you're using Jamovi, uh, in the top right corner of Jamovi, there's three little dots. Um, if you click on those three little dots, that opens up the options menu. And from there, you can change how many decimal places Jamovi shows you. Uh, so if you care about decimals, click on the three dots in the upper right hand corner and you can change how many decimals Jamovi shows you. Um, and there's other options to change the appearance so you can mess around with that if you want to. So very good question. Thank you for bringing that up because I um, meant to mention those things and I would have otherwise forgot. So any other questions or comments from anyone? Yeah, I had one question about the uh, paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as far as any charts or graphs that we will come up with, would you rather those be in the results sections or more the appendix and refer to it from the appendix? That's a good question. Um, I would say do whatever you prefer. I feel like most groups are able to write more clearly if they put it in the appendix, okay. uh, but that's whatever your group prefers. Um, if you write it and you think it allows you to write better to have it in there with the text, then that's perfectly fine. So it's just whatever you prefer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Any other questions or comments? Going once, going twice. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start the lectures. And we're going to start by talking about moderation with regression. Moderation with regression. Um, and as a little note, um, we've already covered a lot of these principles when we talked about ANOVA and chi-square. Uh, so that's why this comes after ANOVA and chi-square. Some of the terms we're gonna mention in this part with moderation with regression are gonna be things we've already talked about. We're now just going back a little bit and applying those terms to regression and figuring out how to run the analyses to do moderation with regression. Okay, 
So to start in research and practice, uh, we're often interested in what we call the direct effects of variables. So how one variable directly relates to another variable, um, how one variable directly impacts another variable. So direct effects represent questions like, does job satisfaction predict performance? That's a direct effect, because we're talking about the direct effect of job satisfaction on performance. Uh, another question might be, does location relate to job commitment? Do people in the American South have higher job commitment than those in the American North? Uh, that would also be a direct effect, because even though we're talking about the difference between groups, uh, South versus North, we're still talking about the direct effect of location on commitment. It's still a direct effect. Uh, one way to think of this is you're talking about direct effects. Let me get my little drawing tool. Uh, you're going to be talking or thinking about direct effects whenever you think of just one variable impacting another variable. If you're ever thinking about one error or two variables with just an arrow in between them, that's a direct effect. That right there is a direct effect. However, sometimes we're interested in beyond direct effects. Sometimes we're interested in models that go beyond direct effects. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. How can variables be included in models that aren't just direct effects, that are, aren't just this very, very simple, you know, two variables, one arrow? How can we add other variables to our model and analyze those variables in a way that goes beyond direct effects? And the first one we'll talk about is moderation. Uh, so with moderation, sometimes we wanted to investigate whether a variable influences the relationship between two other variables. So with a moderator, you're not necessarily talking about does that moderator predict the outcome? It certainly could, but that's not what we're going to be most interested in. Instead, we're wanting to see whether that moderator influences the relationship between two other variables. Um, one way to think about this, and I tend not to word it this way too often, but this helps some students, is think of it as if a variable can predict the relationship between two other variables. If a variable can uh, influence the relationship between two other variables. So if it helps you to think of it as predicting or impacting the relationship, then so be it, think of it that way. But moderation is when you want to investigate whether a variable influences the relationship between two other variables. So some examples of questions you can investigate with moderation would be something like, does the relationship of job satisfaction and performance depend on your tenure? Uh, does the relationship between job satisfaction and performance depend on your tenure? that it could be that job satisfaction and performance have a really strong relationship if you're a newcomer to the company, but it could be that if you're an old time or if you've been there forever, it doesn't matter what your job satisfaction is, your performance is gonna be the same. So in that case, your relationship between job satisfaction and performance would depend on your tenure because it could be really strong if you're new, but it could be really weak if you're old in the company. And if we were to draw that visually, it would look something like this where you have job satisfaction, predicting uh, performance, and then we have tenure. And tenure influences that relationship between job satisfaction and performance. So this model that I, you see on the screen that I drew, that's this relationship right here, just put visually, just put into a model. So if we were to put what this describes right here in text into a model, it would be this right here. Okay. Another question we could ask with, uh, with moderation would be, does the relationship of conscientiousness and job commitment depend on, that says the type of agreeableness, let's just keep it simple. Let's just say, does it depend on agreeableness? Does the relationship of conscientiousness and job commitment depend on agreeableness? So conscientiousness and agreeableness being personality traits. So does it depend, uh, so some people, uh, if you're low, low agreeable, if you're very disagreeable, Maybe the relationship between conscientiousness and job commitment is very weak. Maybe if you're very disagreeable, you're not going to have a strong relationship between your personality trait of conscientiousness and job commitment. But if you're an agreeable person, if you're easygoing, if you're easy to get along with, maybe the relationship between your conscientiousness and job commitment is really strong. So once again, that relationship, whether it's weak or strong, depends on agreeableness. And how that would look in this model up here is we would keep the same circles because moderation is always going to be the relationship between two variables and how that relationship is impacted by a third. But it's going to look like conscientiousness as our predictor, uh, job commitment. So let's put job commitment as our outcome, and then agreeableness as our moderator, and then agreeableness as our moderator. 
So in this example, we have conscientiousness predicting job commitment as moderated by agreeableness. Okay. Any questions at that at this point? Any questions at all at this point? Okay. And one other thing I'll note before moving forward, as I mentioned this before, it's fully possible for your moderator to predict the outcome. That's fully possible, but that's typically not the thing we're interested in with moderators. So although your moderator could predict your outcome, we're typically not interested in that. Instead, we're interested in the moderating effect itself. So just because you might run a regression or a correlation, and you might find something like agreeableness is significantly related to job commitment, that doesn't mean that it can't be a moderator. It can still be a moderator while still predicting the outcome. That's perfectly fine. Okay, so clearing the drawings and moving forward. Uh, here's another visual representation of moderation. Um, yeah, it's there in the PowerPoint if you wanna go back and review it, but that's exactly what we talked about before. We have a predictor, we have an outcome, and we have a moderator. Okay, so when something like this happens, when we have a moderator, that influences the relationship between a predictor and an outcome, we would say we have significant moderation, which makes sense because we have a moderator and a moderator moderates. So if this were to be statistically significant, if this effect was statistically significant, we would say we have significant moderation. We could also say that it's a significant interaction effect or interactive effects. So therefore, if we have a significant moderating effect, if the influence of our moderator is statistically significant, we would say we have uh, moderation, or we could say we have a significant interaction, or we could say we have a significant interaction. And right now that might ring some bells for some of y'all. You might even be thinking, oh, we said that word interaction before, didn't we? That sounds familiar. And the answer is yes. Interactions are familiar to us because we have talked about them before in class. Particularly, when we learned about interactions before, we were talking about ANOVA with two variables as, where, as well as chi-square with two variables. Uh, so before we were talking about ANOVA with two variables and chi-square with two variables, we brought up this idea of interactions. And we talked about it before, the uh, idea of interactions was when we might have two variables that have categories A and B, as well as one and two. And the interaction occurred when one of these cells had a significantly higher value than all of the other cells. For instance, uh, A1 might have a value of 100, whereas all the other ones have a value of one. And before we talked about with it, whether it was a NOVA or chi-square, if something like this happened, that means you have a significant interaction because it's really just one cell driving that effect. It's really just one condition driving that effect. And the, theoretically, conceptually, when you're talking about moderation with regression, or when you're talking about interaction with regression, the same phenomenon is going on the same phenomenon is going on. The only difference is with ANOVA or chi-square, we're looking at categorical variables. So with ANOVA and chi-square, we're looking at categorical variables. Whereas with regression, we're looking at moderation with at least one continuous variable, with at least one continuous predictor. Um, whether it's the predictor or the moderator, uh, at least one of those is continuous. And because it's continuous, that means we can't use ANOVA, we can't use chi-square, Instead, we have to test moderation with regression when at least one of our either predictor or moderator is continuous. Okay. Um, also, something else to note is when we covered uh, interactions with ANOVA and chi-square, the definition that we used for an interaction was when the effect of one variable depends on the other and vice versa. And this definition still applies. You can still apply this definition to moderation with regression. The definition of when the effect of one variable depends on the other and vice versa. And we see that in the figure that we were just looking at before. Because in this figure, we see that the uh, relationship of the predictor on the outcome depends on the moderator. So this relation right here that we're interested in, that relationship depends on the influence of the moderator. So therefore, same terminology we used before, same definitions we used before, the only real difference compared to when we're looking at ANOVA or chi-square as we're looking at continuous variables when we're doing moderation with regression. Okay. And hopefully this will become very evident in this next two slides also. Is before this was uh, an instance of moderation that we looked at or of an interaction that we looked at. In this example, we used an ANOVA to analyze this. So in this example, we had uh, 
non-business students and business students. We had freshmen and sophomores or juniors and seniors, and we had their GPA. So before we were talking about uh, interactions with ANOVA, we said this was an interaction because we have uh, most every group is the, is the same, that if you're a non-business student and you're a freshman or a sophomore, your GPA is two. If you're a non-business student and you're a junior or senior, your GPA is a two. If you are a freshman or a sophomore and you're a business student, your GPA is two. However, you had this one special combination, this one special combination, which was if you're a junior or a senior and you're a business student, your GPA was a 3.75. And that would be an instance of a significant interaction when we're using ANOVA. Uh, this was a significant interaction when using ANOVA because we had two grouping variables, your academic year or your major, business or non-business. And it was that one combination of juniors or seniors that were business majors that was significantly higher than all the other groups. So therefore, this was an interaction when we talked about it with ANOVA because it was not necessarily the effect of, uh, the effect of major. It wasn't necessarily the effect of academic year that predicted your GPA. Instead, it was the special combination of academic major and academic year that determined your GPA. It was only whether you're in this one group or not in this one group that drove the effect. Okay, the concept is still pretty much the same when we're talking about moderation with regression, but now we're looking at continuous variables uh, or at least one of them being a continu continuous variable and this example doesn't really work out that great because it's not truly continuous, but let's just pretend it does. Um, so this is pretty much the same thing we looked at in the prior slide, except now we're treating uh, academic year as a continuous variable. But instead of having uh, just two categories, we made four, and we're just kind of pretending that that's continuous. Yes, I know it's still categorical, but we'll pretend it's continuous. Um, and this is pretty much the same thing we looked at before, that we would also say this is an interaction effect, even though it's continuous, because we have academic year, which is continuous. Uh, we have one of these that's still categorical and that's perfectly fine because we just need one continuous variable to test this with moderation, or sorry, to test moderation with regression. And the other categorical, or the categorical variable being whether you're a business major or a non-business major. And as we see, if you are uh, earlier in your academic career and you are a non-business major or a business major, your GPA is gonna be a two. So if you're early in your academic year, whether you're a business major or a non-business major, your GPA is gonna be a two. If you're further in your academic career and you're a non-business major, your GPA is a two. However, if you're a business major and you're further in your academic career, your GPA is somehow a five. However, that might've happened. We'll just pretend that's okay. Your GPA is a five. So therefore, it's not necessarily the effect of academic year that's predicting your GPA entirely. It's not necessarily the effect of whether you're a business or a non-business major that's predicting your GPA entirely. Instead, it's the interaction of the two. Instead, it's the special combination because it's not until you have students that are further in their academic career and also business majors that you see this dramatic difference, that you see this notable difference. Okay, so that's the way of talking about it when we were looking at ANOVA. So if that makes sense to you, if you understood that with ANOVA and then just translating it to be continuous variables or at least one continuous variable, then think of it that way. Think of it how we just now described it because that works. That's perfectly fine. Uh, if it helps you to think of it as you need this special combination for it to be an interaction, then that's perfectly acceptable. Another way to think about it, and this is particular, this might be easier for continuous variables, but it's up to you. Um, another way to think of it is that when you're looking at an interaction, as we talked about, an interaction is when you have a relationship between two variables that's dependent on a third. That this relationship between X and Y depends on whatever M is uh, to understand that relationship. And we see that in this figure too. We see that you might have the relationship between academic year and GPA. However, this relationship is entirely dependent or mostly dependent on what your major was, that this relationship is very dependent on what your major was because the relationship between academic year and GPA is nothing. That's a null relationship if you're a non-business major because it doesn't matter what your academic year is uh, in relation to your GPA if you're a non-business major because it's always gonna be two because if you're a non-business major, this is a flat line. However, if you're a business major, 
there's a very strong relationship between your academic year and your GPA. So therefore, that would indicate that this relationship between academic year and GPA is strongly influenced by the moderator because when the moderator in this instance, if you're in the, sorry, because the moderator in this instance, if it's non-business students, there's no relationship. However, if it's business students, then there's a very strong relationship. So in this instance, we see visually that the relationship between academic year and GPA is strongly dependent on whether you're a business or a non-business student. So therefore, we would probably say, if we ran an analysis on this or the analysis you'll learn in a few slides, this probably would be a statistically significant moderating effect because the relationship is so different depending on whatever the moderator was, in this case, non-business or business students. Okay. I know that's a lot to take in. Are there any questions at this point about moderation? Anything I can explain further about it? Okay, so if there's no questions, we will continue. Uh, one thing you might be asking yourself is why do we care about moderation? Uh, one reason we might care about moderation is sometimes the true nature of a relationship might be hidden unless we test these moderating effects. The true relationship between two variables might be hidden unless we test these moderating effects. Uh, so for instance, there might be a very strong relationship between two variables that cannot be discovered until you account for that third variable. Then it might look like two variables have no relationship, but once you account for that third variable, suddenly it's a very strong relationship. And we'll see that in the following two slides. In this example, we have the relationship between job satisfaction and job performance, a relationship we've talked about many times before, and it could appear on the surface, that there's no relationship between those two. And we have a, straight, a flat regression line that it doesn't matter what your job satisfaction is, your job performance is gonna be the same no matter what. So it could appear that there's no relationship between those two variables. However, once we account for a third variable, such as job tenure, there might be a very strong relationship. That for people with low job tenure, this relationship is extremely strong and extremely positive, but for people with high job tenure, this relationship is extremely strong, but very negative. So therefore, in this instance, uh, before when we didn't account for that moderator, our line was completely flat because these two conditions averaged together to make a flat line. However, once we were able to test the effect of the moderator and see and uh, parse these relationships apart, separate these groups into two separate groups, we see that there was a hidden effect that before when they're averaged together, it was a null relationship, but when you split them apart, it's a very strong relationship. It's just one is positive, the other is negative. So therefore, we're very interested in moderation to identify these hidden relationships. But a lot of things we look at in both research and practice are very, might have a very strong relation. It might just appear on the surface that there's nothing going on there because some people it's a strong negative, or sorry, for some people it's a strong positive relationship. For other people, it's a strong negative relationship that we can't understand that until we test for moderators. Another example, and this is less dramatic, is if we were looking at something like conscientiousness and job commitment, the relationship between the personality trait of conscientiousness and job commitment, it might on the surface appear that there's a, you know, there's a positive relationship, but it might seem to be a very weak relationship. So we might initially think, well, conscientiousness is not a strong predictor of job commitment, that yeah, even though it's positive, that's a weak relationship. However, it might actually be that there's a hidden moderator there such as agreeableness, like we talked about before, that for people that are low on agreeableness, yeah, there's no relationship, but for people that are high on agreeableness, that there's a much stronger relationship. So it could be that conscientiousness is quite an important predictor of job commitment. It's just people that are low agreeable, there's no relationship between the two, whereas people that are high agreeable, there's a very strong relationship. So especially for those high agreeable people, if we were to just look at conscientiousness and job commitment and then not account for this moderator, we initially would say, well, it's not important. We can ignore that. But then there would be this whole group of high agreeable people that we could then never understand their job commitment because we chose to ignore conscientiousness because we forgot to test for moderators. But then once we test for it, we can see, oh, look, for these high agreeableness people, this relationship is very strong, very significant, very important and therefore we shouldn't be taken, taken into account. 
therefore we should recognize it is indeed very important. Okay. So before we tested interactions with ANOVA and chi-square, and once again, this was when our predictor and moderator were categorical variables, now we're going to test interactions with regression. Uh, this is most commonly used to test interactions with regression when our predictor and moderator are continuous. So it's most common when both of them are continuous, um, such as job satisfaction and conscientiousness, just such as job satisfaction and job commitment, but it could be any continuous variables. But it should be noted that we can test uh, interactions with regression when we have only one of them as continuous. So if we have a continuous variable and let's say a dichotomous moderator, then we could still test that with regression. Or if we have a dichotomous predictor but a continuous moderator, then we could also test that with regression. Uh, so if we have only one of them that's continuous and the other one is dichotomous, then that's perfectly fine too. Uh, but for the purposes of this class, we'll keep it simple. If we're testing interactions with regression, then they're both going to be continuous. So for the purposes of this class, if we're going to test interactions with regression, they're both going to be continuous. Okay, and we're going to start with the easiest example. The easiest example being using regression to analyze one predictor and one moderator. Um, it should be noted we could use regression to test multiple moderators. Uh, so there's research articles that test models that look like this, uh, where you might have I know things are overlapping, that might be hard to see, but I think you can see it. Uh, so we could use regression to test an instance where there's two moderators. We could do that with regression. Uh, we can even do an instance where we have, let me erase. We can even use regression to test something like this that's a moderating effect that has its own moderating effect. And we would call that a three-way three moderation. We could once again test that with regression. But for this class, we're going to keep it simple. If we're going to use moderation with regression, or if we're going to test moderation with regression, we're going to keep it with the simplest model, which is going to be this right here. Just simple one predictor, one outcome, and one moderator. Okay. So to do this, our data set needs to have at least three variables. One variable should be our predictor, one variable should be our moderator, and one variable should be our outcome. And once again, if we're going to do moderation with regression in this class, uh, all three of these will be continuous variables. All three of these will be continuous variables. Okay. So uh, one, let me start by saying our guides will uh, go through this in detail, but I want to give you all just a brief conceptual overview of how this works. So once you get to the guides, this isn't going to be overly confusing because this is somewhat of a confusing process, uh, but this is how it works. Um, in practice, this is how you would actually test moderation with regression. I should note, however, that if you're doing this in Jamovi, this is what Jamovi does behind the scenes. With Jamovi, you just have to tell it, I want to run moderation. This is my predictor. This is my moderator. This is my outcome. But this is what Jamovi does behind the scenes. Alternatively, if you're doing moderation with regression in Excel, you have to do this whole process yourself. And you'll see that in the guides, that if you were to open up the Excel guide versus the Jamovi guide, the Excel guide is going to be a lot longer because you have to do all these steps yourself, whereas Jamovi does it all for you behind the scenes. Okay, so with that noted, the process starts with we have job satisfaction, tenure, and an outcome variable. So I believe in this example, job satisfaction is our predictor, tenure is our moderator, and our outcome variable is our outcome. So we're going to want to see if tenure moderates the relationship between job satisfaction and the outcome. Okay, there is a question. Okay, someone said, can I go back one slide? And I certainly can. And yes, that is true. The slides are indeed on Canvas if you need them, uh, but I'll go back one slide. Just let me know when I can continue. Okay, yep, no problem at all. Uh, but if you need them, they are on Canvas, but I am always have to go back if you need me. Okay, <laughs> and yes, capitalized thanks, so you're welcome. Okay, uh, yeah, so I was saying that you have job satisfaction, tenure, and an outcome. Um, so to start the process of moderation, and this is going to be if we're doing an Excel, because um, Jamovi does all this behind the scenes, we need to do a thing called mean centering. We need to do a thing called mean centering. So to start doing moderation with regression, we want to mean center our predictor and our moderator variable. And to mean center, sorry, to mean center, we calculate the mean of our variable 
and we subtract the mean from each value or observation of that variable. So all mean centering is, is calculating the mean and then subtracting the mean from each observation for that variable. So in this example, we have job satisfaction and tenure. This is our predictor and moderator. We need to mean center both of those. We need to mean center both of those. So to do that, we would first calculate the mean of the two. The mean of job satisfaction in this example is five. The mean of tenure is eight. So this means we subtract five from each observation of job satisfaction, and we subtract eight from each observation of tenure. And it's very important you remember which one is which, because if we were to get these numbers uh, mixed up or confused, your answers are gonna be completely wrong. So you need to make sure you're subtracting five from job satisfaction because its mean is indeed five, we need to subtract eight from all the observations of tenure because its mean for tenure was eight. And we see that on the next slide. We're going to create new columns, the new columns being job satisfaction centered and tenure centered. Uh, make sure you create new columns because we never, ever, 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 ever want to overwrite our original observations. We always want to make new columns. We never want to overwrite our observations. And in these new columns, we're just going to, for job satisfaction, subtract a value of five from each observation. And for tenure, we're gonna subtract a value of eight from each observation. And we see that in the next slide. Uh, something that was originally four for job satisfaction is now negative one. Originally five is now zero, so on and so on. For tenure, originally seven is now negative one. Originally eight is now zero and so on and so on. Y'all get the point. These uh, mean centered variables are simply our original observations minus the mean. And the guide will show you for Excel how you can do that very quickly. You do not have to do this one by one by hand. The guide will show you in Excel how you can ask Excel to do that for you automatically for all your observations. Okay. So then after doing that, oh yeah, sorry, yes. So the question was, and that's a very good question. So the question was, uh, do we have to do this? If you're doing it in Excel, then the answer is yes, you do have to do this. But in Excel, you just make these new columns you make the labels, and then the guides will tell you how to uh, type in a formula and then copy that formula for it to automatically do it for all of your for all your observations. You just have to you sorry you just have to enter the formula for the first observation, and then I'll show you in Excel how I can then copy it for all your other observations. So you just need to do it for the first of each column, and then I'll show you how to copy it for all the other cells in those columns. Uh, but you're correct. In Jamovi, you don't even have to create these mean-centered variables. In Jamovi, you don't even have to create these new columns. Jamovi will do that for you using the moderation buttons. So good question. Very good question. Okay. So with these mean-centered variables created, we now need to create a new variable, a third variable, that's the uh, new mean-centered variables multiplied together. So it's the new mean-centered variables multiplied together. So it's a job satisfaction centered times tenure centered. And we call this the interaction term. This is called the interaction term. So in our new data set, we would have something that looks like this, where we have, oops, where we have a new column. We call it something like JS centered times T centered. And it's simply our job satisfaction centered times our tenure centered. And we see that negative one times negative one is one, zero times zero is zero one times one is one and so on and so on. And once again, in Excel, you do have to do this yourself. You would have to add the column, you would have to label it, and then you would have to type in the formula for the first cell. And then my guide shows you how to copy it automatically for all the others. Uh, but in Jamovi, you do not need to create these new variables. Jamovi will do it behind the scenes for you. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll go ahead and note this now. Um, one thing that's very important is if you're running moderation with regression uh, and you're trying to report this, whether to your boss or whether for research purposes, it's very important to note that you followed this process. It's very important to note that you centered your variables and then you multiplied your mean centered variables together to create your interaction term. Uh, because this is the proper way of doing it. This is how you get the correct results. Uh, but it's not guaranteed that everyone knows that. Um, I'm an academic researcher. I do a lot of research. Uh, one thing I'm expected to do as a researcher is to review other people's research. There's been a lot of times that I've had to reject papers that I get asked to review because people say that, oh, I ran my moderation, I multiplied my two variables together to get my interaction term, and they never centered their variables. So they got com 
they got something that's not interpretable from their analyses, or at least not as easily interpretable, because they forgot to mean center. So even professors, even academic researchers, forget to go through all these steps sometimes. And it's very important that you do not forget to do it yourself. Okay, so with that noted, uh, you then perform a typical regression using only the centered variables and the interaction term. So you then perform a regression using only your centered variables and your interaction term. So therefore, going back one slide, when we run our regression, we do not want to include our original variables in the regression. Instead, we want to have our centered variables and the interaction term predicting our outcome. Do not include those original variables in that regression. So make sure you do not include those. Okay, so therefore we perform a typical regression using only the centered variables and the interaction term. And our results might look something like this. Our results might look something like this, where we have our job satisfaction centered on one line, we might have tenure centered on the other, then we would have our interaction term on the other line. And from this result, we can determine whether we have a significant moderation or a significant moderating effect based on the significance of our interaction term, which we can see right here. So right here, we see that there's two asterisks. That means we have a significant moderating effect. That means that uh, tenure in this example uh, significantly moderated the effect of job satisfaction on job performance, I believe, or whatever our outcome variable was. And we determine that through this right here. So therefore, if you have a significant interaction effect, you would say you have a significant uh, moderating effect, or sorry, let me rephrase that. If you have a significant interaction term, you would then say you have a significant moderating effect. So therefore, our model that looks like this, we would say we found support for that model. We would say that we found support for that model because our interaction term was significant. So therefore, our moderating effect was statistically significant and we found support for our moderating effect. Once again, just like ANOVA and chi-square, if we have a significant moderating effect, we tend to then not interpret our lower order terms. We tend to then not interpret, in this case, our direct effects. So even if these were significant, if we found a significant moderating effect, we typically then would not talk about our direct effects. So in this case, job satisfaction times tenure, if that's significant, we then wouldn't really talk about our job satisfaction as a predictor uh, because our interaction term was significant. And that's the only thing we would focus on. On the other hand, let me clear this. On the other hand, if our interaction term was not significant, so if this was not significant, but let's say job satisfaction was, we then would interpret that because our moderating effect was not significant uh, if we cover up those asterisks. And we would then just say that job satisfaction had a significant effect on our outcome and there was no significant moderating effect and no significant direct effect of tenure. So therefore, if our results look something like this mm -hmm. with only job satisfaction uh, being statistically significant, our supported model would be this down here with just our predictor predicting our outcome with our moderator doing nothing because the direct effect of our moderator was not significant and the interaction term was not significant in this example where we covered up those asterisks. Um, so if you do this in Jamovi and Jamovi does the backend work, do you still specify that you mean centered your variables? That is a wonderful question. That is a very good question. Um, the answer is if you're ever using a program that does backend work, you need to then do uh, research on the internet to see, well, what is that backend work? What, uh, what's going on behind the scenes? Um, with Jamovi, I did the backend work. I could not find a lot of clear, uh, reporting on exactly what Jamovi does behind the scenes when it comes to moderation. I'm pretty confident it does mean centered. So for the purposes of this class, if you're using Jamovi, then I will, then I want you to say that you mean centered your variables because I'm pretty sure Jamovi mean centers the variables. I will make a caveat that I'm not a hundred percent sure about that though. Um, Cause I looked through Jamovi's uh, reporting. I looked through their, uh, their user documents. And for their section on moderation in Jamovi, it was like very, very, very brief. It didn't provide that many details. So I'm not 100% sure exactly what it does behind the scenes, but I'm pretty confident that it does mean centered um, the variables. The reason why I'm confident is because before uh, making my class lectures for this unit, I went ahead and ran a mean centered regression. Um, yeah, and I'll answer that in a second. Uh, uh, for the purposes of this class, I went ahead and did a mean centered regression and did the interaction term in Excel. And I compared those results with Jamovi and the, uh, the 
p values were the same across both. Uh, some of the and all the other results are very similar. They weren't hundred percent the same. So I'm assuming that it does mean centering, but there are some differences there, and I'm not hundred percent sure where those differences arise from. Uh, so if you find out yourself, if you find documentation somewhere on the internet that says, hey, here's exactly what Jamovi does when you tell it to do moderation, please let me know. I would greatly appreciate that. And that goes for the entire class. Um, the other question was for exam purposes, how do we respond? The answer is for exam purposes, I'm probably going to only expect you to give me, um, and I'm going to clear things on the screen. Okay. What's that? Hmm. Sorry, I have to sneeze. It keeps on getting caught. Okay, I'll continue until I sneeze. Um, so for exam purposes, I would want you to be able to run this regression. Uh, I would want you to mean center your variables. And if you're in Jamovi, it should automatically mean center them. So I'll want you to report on an exam. I'll say something like, what's the standardized beta of the interaction term? Actually, I take that back. On the exam, I'll probably ask you, what's the unstandardized beta of the interaction term? What's the standard error? And then was that statistically significant? So I want you to be able to give me the numbers. So just whether you're using Jamovi or Excel, give me the numbers that I ask for. Um, and then if I do ask for anything, I'll say, you know, give me a three sentence summary of what analysis you ran and what the results looked like. So I'd be able to expect you to say that we ran a mean centered uh, regression that included our interaction term and we found the result was statistically significant. So for the purposes of an exam, uh, just assume that Jamovi is doing a mean centered approach to your moderation. Uh, and I would want you to be able to tell me what the numerical results are and to be able to interpret was your interaction effect statistically significant or not statistically significant? So that's what I would expect on an exam. Okay, very good questions. Are there any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments at all? Okay, so I'm going to continue. Give me one sec. Okay, yes, so I'm going to continue. Okay, and that's all for moderation with regression. So if there aren't any questions, we are now going to just go ahead and cover mediation with regression. Uh, and that'll be it for the day. Uh, so I think this should probably take another maybe 30 minutes, and then I'll give you all the rest of the class time to do the analyses yourself, and I'll be available for any questions. Okay, so with mediation with regression. Uh, so mediation with regression in research and practice, once again, we often investigate the direct effect of variables. So we often ask questions like, does job satisfaction predict job performance? Once again, a direct effect of job satisfaction on job performance. Things like, does location relate to job commitment? So even though it's the differences between groups, north versus south, it's still a direct effect because we're looking at its direct impact on job commitment. So once again, research and practice, we often investigate direct effects. But sometimes we want to see whether a variable explains the relationship between two variables. Sometimes we want to investigate whether a variable explains the relationship between two variables. So for instance, with job satisfaction performance, we might ask, is the relationship of job satisfaction performance explained by motivation, for example? So we would look at something like this. Does job satisfaction and performance is that relationship explained by motivation? Is motivation this intervening variable that explains the relationship between job satisfaction and performance? Another example of a similar question where we're looking at whether a third variable explains the relationship between two others is does the relationship of location and job commitment, is that explained, oops, let me back up, undo, job commitment, is that explained by employee benefits? So it could be that we have people in the South uh, have higher job commitment than people in the North. However, it could just be people in the South happen to have higher job benefits or better job benefits. So we could investigate whether this third variable benefits explains the relationship between two other variables, location and job commitment. So as you probably guessed, whenever we're asking questions like that, those would be instances of mediation. Those would be instances of mediation where we have a mediator so the mediator is the thing we call that variable that comes in the middle. So mediation is when we have a mediator that comes between a predictor and an outcome. Instances we wanna test whether a mediator explains the relationship between a predictor and an outcome, where we would have something like job satisfaction and job performance 
then we want to see whether motivation explains that relationship. So if we were to talk about the sequential link, we would say that people with higher job satisfaction have higher motivation, and therefore they have higher job performance. So each of these would be positive relationships and it's motivation that explains the overall effect between job satisfaction and job performance. Okay, uh, we call this mediation. Uh, this is also called an indirect effect. Uh, so before direct effects are when we have two variables that have a direct effect on each other. Uh, we call uh, mediation, we can also call it an indirect effect because we have a variable that indirectly affects another variable through a third variable. So we call it an indirect effect because we have an X variable that indirectly influences a Y variable through a mediating variable. And that's why we call it an indirect effect because a direct effect, we're talking about direct impacts, indirect effects or mediators have an impact on an outcome via a third variable. So, okay. So a question you might be asking is why do we care about mediation? And the answer is sometimes we can't understand the true effect of a variable until we understand the mediating variables. Sometimes we can't understand the true effect of a variable until we understand the mediating variables. Uh, so therefore it's very important to understand uh, what these meeting, mediating variables are so we can not only get a better understanding of that relationship, but so we can also possibly um, learn how to control that relationship or learn how to uh, more precisely impact that relationship. Uh, so one example might be, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, we might have something like, let's say, uh, let's just keep it simple. Uh, conscientiousness relates to job performance. Uh, so we might know that relationship exists, but we might not know why. Conscient conscientiousness is a personality trait uh, and personality traits tend to have meeting and effects between them and their more distal outcomes like job performance. So therefore we might investigate increased motivation as a mediator and see that conscientious people tend to just be more motivated and therefore they tend to have higher job performance. So therefore by understanding that meeting and, meeting and effect, we could then think, well, what might uh, influence that relationship between conscientiousness and motivation? We might not have conceptualized that before. We might not have thought about that before. Uh, so therefore, since conscientiousness is known to influence job performance due to higher motivation, we can now think of things like, well, maybe we need to give extra benefits to people that are low on conscientiousness. So therefore they might have higher motivation. And previously we might not have thought about that before when we're just looking at the relationship between conscientiousness and job performance, because we weren't aware of why that relationship occurred. But now that we understand why that relationship occurs, we can now think of things we can uh, implement to influence that relationship and make some of our less conscientious employees become higher performers. So that's just one of the reasons we would be interested with mediation. There's tons of others that we uh, could be interested with, uh, but we're not going to cover all those other instances. Just know it's extremely important. Okay. Another example of when we might would use mediation would be something like, uh, we haven't talked about this in class, but there's another personality trait called Machiavellianism. Uh, Machiavellianism, or just mock for short, uh, is the tendency to be manipulative, the tendency to want to get ahead, the tendency to use uh, political uh, actions to get ahead in the workplace. Uh, I'm sure everyone here knows a mock, has worked with a mock before. Mocks are really bad people to work with because they're very uh, manipulative. Um, but we know that Machiavellianism relates to worse team performance, that if you have a mock on your team, your team is just automatically, automatically going to do worse. Uh, but that's really not enough to do anything about that. That's not really enough to do anything because typically um, mocks are manipulative, but they don't really, usually at least, they don't cross the line. You can just fire them uh, because, you know, they, they're sneaky. They're, uh, they're more covert with their actions. So it's much harder just to get rid of a mock. So instead we might wanna do something like determine why a mock leads to worse team performance. And it could be due to their social undermining behaviors. It could be due to their sneaky behaviors where they intentionally try to make their teammates look worse so they look better. So therefore, since we know that mocks are active social underminers, we could do certain procedures to make sure that they don't have a lot of power to do that. They don't have a lot of power to social undermine. So things like make sure that if you have a mock on your team, 
they're not the team leader. Because if a mock is your team leader, they're going to go through a lot of effort to make it look like everyone else on the team sucks and they're the savior of the team. Um, or maybe if a mock is a team member, make sure they're always working closely with someone to make sure that they're not undermining everyone else. So therefore, by investigating these mediating effects, we can then identify remedies uh, to help improve this overall relationship in this case of Machiavellianism and team performance. Okay. So with regression, we can test mediated effects using continuous variables. And that's what we're going to talk about in this class is if we have a continuous predictor and a continuous mediator and how we can use regression to test for medi mediating effects with a continuous predictor and a continuous mediator. Uh, the exact steps to do this differs on your statistical program. Uh, one thing also to note is with moderation, there's really only one way to test moderation and that's mean centering your variables and then creating that interaction term. Yes, there's like two or three other ways, but mean centering is the easiest, that's the most popular. Uh, with mediation, there's tons of ways to test for mediation. Uh, there's so bell testing, there's the Baron and Kinney approach, there's bootstrapping, uh, there's tons of ways to test for mediation. Uh, so know that the ways to test your mediation differs on your statistical program, but it also differs based on the analysis you want to conduct to test for mediation. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, with the, this class, if you're using Excel, you're going to do a thing called a Sobel test. Uh, so the guide for Excel will show you how to do a Sobel test. Sobel tests work well. Sobel tests are fine. Uh, with Jamovi, I'm pretty confident that Jamovi does a thing called bootstrapping. Uh, bootstrapping is better than Sobel testing. Bootstrapping provides more accurate results than uh, Sobel testing, uh, but they're both fine. Uh, so if you want to, for the test purposes or exam purposes, if you want to use either Excel or Jamovi for mediation, I'm happy with both because I'm perfectly fine with both Sobel testing and bootstrapping. Uh, just know that the uh, both of these approaches, though, have the same conceptual, I guess, approach. That no matter whether you're using Sobel testing or bootstrapping, your mediation is going to look like this. Your mediation is going to look like this. And what uh, both approaches do is it first assesses the effect of your predictor on the mediator. It first assesses the effect of your predictor on the mediator. And that we call the A relationship. So we're talking about uh, mediation. We're talking about mediation. The effect of the predictor on the mediator is going to be your A relationship. And if you're doing Sobel testing, you're going to start by just doing a simple regression where your predictor predicts your mediator. Typically, the second step with testing for mediation is then you assess the relationship of both the predictor and the mediator on your outcome variable. So both your predictor and the mediator on your outcome variable. So uh, once again, with so Sobel testing, well, let me back up real quick. Uh, therefore, when we do both the predictor and the mediator predicting the outcome, we then call the relationship between the mediator and the outcome our B path. So whereas the A path was predictor on mediator, our B path is the relationship of the mediator on the outcome when accounting for our predictor, when accounting for our predictor. And uh, if you're using Excel and you're doing so bell testing, you're literally just going to start by calculating uh, first a regression with your predictor on your mediator to get your A path, but then you're going to do another regression. You're going to do a second regression where you calculate your predictor and your mediator predicting your outcome via regression. You're just going to do a regression with both of them predicting your outcome. So therefore, uh, once you get your A path and your B path, uh, the analyses are going to look at the effects of both of them together. It's going to, uh, one way to think about it is quite literally just multiply these effects together. What is the effect of A times B? And that will give you an indicator of the indirect effect. That will give you an indicator whether your mediator is statistically significant or whether you have a significant indirect effect. Is the effect of A times B. Um, there's more complicated analyses that go on behind the scenes. It's not just A times B. Uh, and that's why when you're doing so bell testing, as you'll see in the guide, uh, you have to take your beta, uh, your, sorry, you have to take your re regression coefficients, which is your beta and your standard error, and you put them into a calculator. So you put in the unstandardized beta and the standard error associated with A and B, and you put those into a calculator. But it's pretty much looking at the effect of A times B just with a little bit more calculations behind the scenes. Uh, likewise, bootstrapping does the same thing, A times B, but bootstrapping does a lot more calcu or sorry, a lot more compu complicated calculations. Uh, just know in general, 
it's the effect of A times B is your indirect effect. And that's what this uh, next slide says, that in short mediation analyses uh, assess the effect of the predictor on the mediator, which we call our A path, and then assesses the effect of the mediator on the outcome while accounting for the predictor, which is our B path, and then it assesses the effect of the predictor on the outcome via the mediator by analyzing A times B. And it's this third step down here that tells us whether our mediation is statistically significant. It's this third step that we're really interested in in testing our mediation and determining whether it's statistically significant. This is indirect effect of A times B. So this is what tests whether our predictor influences our mediator, which then influences our outcome, and whether this overall effect is statistically significant. This is third bullet point right here. Okay, um, and we are not going to go through mediation step by step because it does differ by both programs. And what I just told you conceptually is what both programs do behind the scenes. Uh, what I just told you conceptually is what both programs do behind the scenes. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into the mathematics behind it because like I said, the mathematics for Sobel testing and bootstrapping are more complicated than I would expect you to have to learn in an MBA class. Um, but okay. are there any questions at all about mediation? Um, general question, can we calculate everything in the final exam with Jamovi or do we need Excel in something? I am pretty confident that you can do everything in Jamovi. I'm pretty certain you can do everything in Jamovi. Um, I will say there are certain things you cannot do in Excel. Uh, so if you're planning on only using Excel for the final exam, then you will get some questions wrong because there are some things Excel cannot do. Um, so therefore, Excel cannot do everything for the final exam. I'm pretty confident Jamovi can do everything for the final exam. So I think if you're going to stick with one, I would stick with just Jamovi because I think it can do everything. Um, of course, I will send an email to the class if when I'm making the exam, I realize, oh crap, there is a question that Jamovi cannot do. I will be certain to email the class, but as of right now, I assume Jamovi can do everything. So good question, very good question. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? Where did you say the practice questions were? Yeah, so if you go to maxihower.com uh, and if you pull up the statistics help pages, let me see if I can do it right now and I'll send a link to the chat window. So, one sec, sorry. Oh, no. Okay, go to maxihower.com. Uh, if you go to something like Jamovi statistics help, uh, which I'm going to send to the chat window. Yes, so thank you for doing that. If you scroll down on that page, uh, there are a lot of practice data sets. So they're called things like chi-square practice, correlation practice, descriptive statistics practice. Uh, those are data sets. I think each of those have three examples that will have the questions and then also have the answers there so you can practice on your own. Yes, they do have the answers there with them. Uh, and then there was another question that was, will the exam be more concentrated on data sets and running the analysis? Yeah, so the exam will be entirely data sets and running the analysis. Uh, there will not be any questions on definitions. You do not have to know any definitions for the exam. It's all data set and analyses. Um, at most, at the very most, I might ask something like, uh, like after you run a regression, let's say you run a mediation and you gave your Sobel test results or your bootstrapping results, or just your mediation results, I might would ask you something like, uh, based on the results you just got, provide two or three sentences to interpret your findings. So I would expect you to be able to know that, hey, my interaction term was statistically significant. That means I do have significant moderation that let's say tenure moderated the effect of job satisfaction on job performance. So I would expect you to be able to verbalize uh, what the results mean. And in the case like moderation, uh, it would not be enough just to say, it was a significant moderating effect. I would expect you to have to say that something like tenure moderated the effect of job satisfaction on job performance. You would actually have to verbalize uh, what influenced what pretty much. Uh, similarly with regression, uh, if I told you to run a regression where three variables predicted an outcome, I would expect you to be able to tell me which of those were statistically significant. And I would also expect you to say something like, uh, job satisfaction uh, significantly predicted job performance, whereas conscientiousness and agreeableness did not. Um, two things about that, not only in that sentence would you be able to identify what was significant, what was not. Uh, when you say like things like job satisfaction predicted performance, 
that shows to me that you know what's your predictors and what's your outcomes. Uh, it would not be enough if you ran a regression just to say that job satisfaction was related to job performance or these variables were somehow significantly interrelated. Uh, that would not be enough just to say that, you know, I tested four variables, two of them were significant. You actually have to show me if you're running a regression, you know what your predictors and you know what your outcomes were. So very good questions, very, very good questions. Um, any other questions or comments? Going once, going twice. Okay, so that is all for the lecture portion of today. Um, so now y'all have time to practice running the analyses yourself. Um, so I'm going to turn my camera off. I'm gonna take personally a five to 10 minute break. As you're doing the analyses, feel free to type anything into the chat window. And then when I notice it, I'll turn my camera back on and I'll answer your questions. So thank you all for hanging in there. Sorry, let me back up. Thank you all for hanging in there today. Um, I know that stats is not the most exciting topic, uh, but also this is the last lecture. So thank you all for hanging in there all semester. I hope you enjoyed it at least somewhat. Um, I know stats is not the most thrilling thing, but y'all did a wonderful job. I really appreciated your enthusiasm all throughout the semester. Um, so good luck studying for the final. Good luck finishing your paper. Uh, and I'm always available to help with anything. So if you ever have any stats questions as you move forward in your academic career, please send them to me. Um, and if you're ever, ever, ever interested in something like getting a, doing something crazy like getting a PhD, uh, let me know about that too. Uh, in the College of Business here, my main responsibility is teaching in the PhD program. Uh, that's what I teach in most often. That's what I'm evaluated on the most. Uh, so if you ever have any interest in getting a PhD, uh, please let me know. I'm always happy to talk about it. Uh, we have a lot of students uh, from South Alabama who then go through our PhD program and they're wonderful students. So we always love having South Alabama students go through our PhD program. So that's my little 30 second uh, wrap up. So thank you all for everything. Uh, and yeah, good luck on the exam, good luck on the paper. And I'll be back in 10 minutes to answer any questions and uh, anything else you might have, any other questions you might have. So thank you all.